Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I hope everyone had a blessed Christmas and a new year. We now entered into the year 2019, and I believe that we'll see some exciting things take place this year, uh, prophetically speaking. And uh, so we continue here in our studies through Romans verse by verse. Uh, I don't normally do this, but I want to begin by uh, reading in the third chapter of the uh, Epistle to the Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 3, since it speaks directly to what we'll be looking at here in uh, these several verses here in, in Romans. So... Uh, Foolish Galatians, O oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, Doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, Yet, if it be confirmed, no man disannuls or adds thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, 
which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So ends the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father, again, we just we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for just the privilege that you've given us and the opportunity that you that is ours to worship you and to feast upon your word. We are keenly aware of just how little we know and yet how immense is your book, the word of our God. May the Holy Spirit be the one who just filters out the foolishness, but seals the truth and only the truth to our hearts. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. We've been uh, studying together in the uh, Epistle to the Romans, if you're new to these series uh, of videos, and in our last video, our last study together, we had reached the 15th verse, I believe, of the fourth chapter, Romans chapter 4, verse 15. The Holy Spirit is laid out very carefully uh, through what we've looked at here previously, that man is totally depraved, he's devoted much of scripture to that, that there's no, no good in man. Man is separated from God, but was justified freely by God's grace. And then used Abraham as an illustration of how that grace works. And we know that God called Abraham out of his former place I believe that is highly symbolic of kind of even represents our lives today. It is it's easy if one is not careful with this book to reach the conclusion that that many Christians reach that Abraham decided to believe God and and because of that initial decision on his part 
God made him righteous. It's the uh, effect, cause and effect sort of thing. And, and that means that Abraham was not totally depraved. And as I pointed out in previous studies, as we've looked at and we've taken a hard look at through the beginning of from chapter one of Romans, modern Christianity wants to preach total depravity without total depravity. And you can't do that and be consistent with this book. Normally, we, we look at verses to support the, the theological position of, of total depravity, such as, as the, the natural man can't enter heaven, the natural man cannot come to God. These are verses of, of Scripture. They're in your book. You're in, they're in your Bible. Whatever, I don't care what translation you have. The natural man cannot hear the word of God. The natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit of God. The natural man can't believe God. And the natural man cannot cease sinning. These are all passages of scripture. I would think the, the key passage on total depravity, and it's it really is kind of hard to, to choose what verse might be, but in my opinion, at least, John chapter 10, that if you're not my sheep, you can't believe. And there, the principle is clearly set forth that you don't become a sheep by believing. You believe because you are already a sheep. And that's the principle in Abraham's life. He believed God because he was made righteous because God made him righteous. When he believed God, legizomai, that that was reckoned, that reached that reached a logical conclusion that he was righteous. Now, there are some other uh, incidental indications of total depravity that are serious in their power if, if one looks at them carefully. Uh, and that is Romans 4, 13. That's, that's one of them, for one of them. Because the law worketh wrath. Or where no law is, there is no transgression. The law only works wrath for those who disobey it or who break it, who overstep it. And the transgression, the word there is parabesis, uh, to overstep a bound or or a law or a regulation. That verse infers that everybody does that. Everybody. It doesn't say that it doesn't say that the law works wrath for those who break it. It says the law works wrath. The inference has to be that the natural man always breaks the law. Then we read in Galatians, or as we read in Galatians before we began here, for they who are of the works of the law are under a curse. No, they're not unless they break it. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do it. So, I mean, what's the infer? What what is what is the Holy Spirit trying to say? What is the message that He's trying to convey? What's the inference? Nobody does that, and so verses like this bring out the truth of man's total depravity. Man cannot come to God. God comes to man. In Galatians, after you have known God, or rather, after ye are known of God. And what the modern church wants to do is put man in the driver's seat. It's, it's irresistible on their part. It's God who works all things after the counsel of his own will. If they which are of the law be heirs, then faithfulness is annulled. We talked about that in the last video. 
the promises made of no effect. If there had been a law given which could have brought life or brought righteousness, Christ died for nothing. He died in vain. But there is no law that would bring life. There is no possibility that man could obey the law. It works wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. This is where we're at in our study here. The concept that I get out of that is that law is not made for a righteous man. This is exactly what this book says. Now, Christ did not destroy the law. What he did is he came to fulfill the law so that you are not under law, but under grace. It isn't that law doesn't exist. It is the fact that you are not under the discipline or the stewardship, if you, or, or the, what I like to say, the principle of law, law keeping as a rule of life. You are under grace. And that seems a, a concept, a difficult concept for Christians to grasp. You will never stand in judgment for sin. You have a peace with God that passes understanding. There is no judgment for you who are in Christ. Romans 8.1 Now, I am not in any way suggesting that there are not natural results or consequences of sin. If you rob a bank, you, you just... I'm, I, might you know may well go to jail if you murder someone you may well be put to death by the government but you will not stand in judgment before god and if you think that that you will if that's what you think then you don't understand grace in no way am i asking you to forget the natural consequences consequences that result from sin, folks. I'm not doing it, but I want you to know the peace of God that passes understanding that, that you stand before him not only with no judgment prospect, but you stand before him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable because all of the demands of the law were met in Christ. And as you were made a sinner in Adam, in the same way, totally separate from you, you were made righteous in Christ. What a marvelous, marvelous truth. How few Christians seem to grasp the wonders of the grace of God. This ministry was founded on that principle of grace. If I can't teach grace, I'm not going to teach at all. I may have mentioned this before. I, I was preaching in a church many years ago. This was back, I believe, in the 90s, I, I believe. when I And when I was finished, I, was, I asked if anyone had any questions, which is something that I usually try to do. And somebody raised their hand and they said, they said, well, do you think someone could commit murder and go to heaven? And I said, well, you mean like David? And the pastor asked me to leave the church. Now, I, I thought David did. I not only thought he did, I, I thought he premeditated it, and I thought he topped it off by committing adultery. Now, David paid physically for that sin. But... He stands uncondemned, or he stood uncondemned before God. He's a man after God's own heart. And you and I stand under grace, not under law. You can't break a law for which you will stand in judgment before God. That's grace. Therefore, 
since everyone breaks the law, total depravity, therefore, well, my Bible says, it is of faith, the Greek, therefore, from faith, in order that, by grace, that and that faith is, is genitive, I believe the word should be translated faithfulness, it is, it, it, the genitive shows possession. If that is yours, it's tenuous. If it's your faith, it's tenuous. It's it's difficult to get the concept across. I've re I've repeated this several times in these studies. I've repeated it. I don't know how many times. I couldn't care to recall the number of times through emails. That theologically, it is impossible to separate your faith in Christ from the faithfulness of. Christ. It is not wrong to think about trust and faith in Christ as long as you recognize that that's the result of the faithfulness of Christ. There is no exercise of the unregenerate man. There is no, no exercise of the natural man that has faith in God. That, that is a myth, folks. I am persuaded that much of modern Christianity is an attempt to clean up the flesh. Well, actually, to resurrect the flesh. And then, secondly, to clean up the old man. But the works of the flesh are manifest. Let me summarize it. They are all evil. There isn't anything, anything, the flesh does in the sight of God that's good. Nothing. The flesh profits nothing. Therefore, the faith that you exercise in Christ, the proper faith, is the result of the faithfulness of Christ that's been imputed to you in the righteousness of Christ. There are two primary primary theological positions. One is that Christ died for you and began a, a process, a painful and slow, painstaking process that will maybe, maybe eventually result in you being made righteous if you work hard enough at it or or whatever. You, you know, you're a little bit there and tomorrow you'll be a little bit more. And if you, you keep on striving and struggling, tomorrow you'll be a little bit more. And and one of the verses that people use for that is that our salvation is now nearer than the day you first believed. But your redemption is not any nearer. There's a huge biblical difference between your deliverance and your redemption. I pointed this out. These are two distinctly separate words. We can't use them interchangeably. I don't believe that the scriptures declare that by the obedience of Christ, you will eventually, after a long, slow, and painful process, maybe, if you're lucky enough or work hard at it enough, you might be made righteous. It is he. It is he who became sin for us. And I have to pause every time I think about that. I mean, I don't think that we can delve into the depths of, and the horror of that simple verse, it is he who was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And it is God who declares in the indicative mood that you are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. You, you may not be in the sight of your family. You may not be in your through your own eyes. Unfortunately, some would have to disagree with that. You may not be in the eyes of Hillary Clinton. Okay, I probably shouldn't have said that. But you are in his. You're not a deplorable. And it's because of the faithfulness and by God's grace, so that, the promise is certain to all the seed. 
I don't believe I could ever find a better, a better illustration of the difference between a synergistic gospel, which is not the gospel, and the monergistic gospel, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, than the illustration that you now see on your screen. I didn't draw that. And you and I are not alone by any means when it comes to the truth that man is totally depraved and unable to respond, but is in fact spiritually dead and until God raises us from the dead and makes us a new creation in Christ. We can't hear God, much less respond to God in faith. Modern Christianity today believes in and promotes a synergistic gospel. Throw a life, life ring, a lifesaver to the, to the dead guy which is not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not the gospel by which we are redeemed. Now, does that mean that the churches, uh, Steve, what are you saying? You're saying the churches contain a multitude of people uh, the world over who are not redeemed? No, it does not mean that because of the very nature of the true gospel itself. Many simply do not understand that God redeemed them based upon the finished work of Christ. They're redeemed. They just, they don't, but they don't, they don't quite understand the process. They don't understand how they came to be redeemed. They, they, they believe they redeemed themselves by something that they did. They're not aware of the glorious truth. They, well, they just fail to understand grace. They're part of a religious merit-based system, and we find ourselves theologically apart from it, so much that, that we're oftentimes persecuted by it, ridiculed by it, mocked by it. And what many do not understand, folks, listen to me, this is what they don't understand, is that the greatest suffering that a child of God can endure in this life a suffering, I believe, surpasses even that of martyrdom. That's right, martyrdom. Is being a stranger in your own country, or a stranger in your own house, a stranger in your own congregation, alienated from your own people. It was not the non-believing world that hated our Lord and his people and put them to death. Oh, no. It was a religious system that believed the preaching of the cross of Christ and everything that it that implies to be plain foolishness. They considered it foolish. I implore you to meditate on that fact. I don't know if I've mentioned this before that a, a dear friend of mine that I'd, I'd corresponded with regularly for some quite some time through the through email he wrote to me and he was describing how that he and a group of others were involved in uh, street preaching this was in a, a major metropolitan area and, and they were tired and discouraged the work was hard and I wanted to lift his spirits I wanted to get him to rejoice in the Lord that he might know the peace of God that passes understanding and the joy that's unspeakable. And, and so I, I wrote him back and I said, just realize that in the hands of the sovereign God, 10,000 years from now, there won't be anybody in hell who should have been in heaven. And there won't be anybody in heaven who should have been in hell. And the brother asked me to never contact him again. He wanted to leave the eternal destiny of those people in his own hands. And someone lovingly tells him that it was in God's hands. 
How many of the sea, folks? Read it. How many of the sea? All. In order that the promise might be absolutely certain to all the seed of all that thou hast given me, I have lost none. You are in Christ when he died on the cross. You were in Christ when he was buried. And you were in Christ when he rose from the dead. It's easy to get in trouble with modern Christians. I personally, uh, not, you can have all, you can have any other convictions you want, but I personally am absolutely convinced it is immensely more important to really comprehend what Christ has done for you than it is to lead one soul to Christ. And that shocks people. I have a uh, tremendous love for all of you people, all of God's people. The words that I say in these videos, I love you all. I truly, those aren't just, I'm not just throwing those out there for no, no reason. It was the grace of God through the faithfulness of Christ that made the inheritance absolutely certain to all the seed. Not one will be missed. Not one will fall through the cracks. Not one is outside of the sovereign love and care and direction of our loving Heavenly Father. Oh, I want you to, under, to know the love of God. Absolutely certain to all the seed, not only those which are from law, which would be the Jews, but also to those which are from Abraham's faith. For in fact, he's the father of both groups. He's the father of us all. Now, I suppose technically speaking, I mean, if you're a Gentile, if you're an Oki, well, he's not your physical father, but he is your spiritual father. And we see that in Galatians chapter 3. When he's speaking of Abraham, he saith, Not as to seeds as of many, but to thy seed singular, which is Christ. And what the Holy Spirit is doing through Paul, when he addresses the Galatians, would, would be extremely important to the Jew. For the Jew in reading Hebrew could go back where God had made the promise to Abraham. And in fact, the Hebrew word is singular. It's not plural. It's singular. The Hebrew word for seed, it has both a singular and a plural construction. And when God came to Abraham, whose, whose name means the father of a multitude, and in fact had told him, had told, God told Abraham that his seed would be as the stars of the heaven and the sands of the sea, the Holy Spirit, speaking to Abraham, used a singular Hebrew word, And what the Holy Spirit is doing in Galatians is pointing that out. Why do you suppose it was a singular word? Because it was referring to Christ. We didn't know that. I, I didn't know that Abraham knew that. I, did Abraham know that? I don't know. I don't know if Abraham knew that or not. I don't know. But we know that 
because God revealed it in the book of Galatians that what he was really promising to Abraham was Christ. And the chapter closes in Galatians chapter 3, if you're Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed? And now the Greek word is singular. You are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So that God sees us in Christ. What a marvelous truth of grace. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Don't read that too quickly. You got to visualize God speaking to Abraham. And we, we go back many, many years, and there's Abraham who doesn't have any kids. And God changes his name from Abram to Abraham. Abraham means a father of, of a height or father of many, and Abraham means it, with the harsh breathing on it, Abraham means a father of a multitude. And God says to him, I have made thee a father of many nations. Not I will make you. As Abraham stood before God, God's positive languages that he already was the father of many nations. Now, only God could do that. There's no time with God. I mean, to us, there's past, present, future. And I believe God accommodates himself to that. God says, I will do this. I have done that. And, and well, that's what he says to Abraham. Abraham he could, he, Abraham could absolutely walk out of there and he, and Abraham could say, I am the father of many nations. Not something to be anticipated, but something that is already viably true. We see the same comments of God in, in, in example, uh, for example, the, uh, in the epistle to the Colossians, you are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in God's sight. In Ephesians, you already are seated in the heavenlies, co-seated with Christ in the heavenly places. These are all grand spiritual truths. They are presently, viably true. It's not... I. Here's one I love to give people. It's not that we're going to have eternal life. We have it now. I have made thee a father of many nations. In fact, as it is, it is written, and of course, it's a perfect passive. It always is. Virtually any place you see that, that in the Greek, as it is written, it's a perfect passive. Fact that it was written in past time and stands eternally written. I have made thee, and this is a perfect tense, perfect tense. When God said this to Abraham, he said to Abraham, I've already done this. This is already true. In past time, and I'm simply stressing the present reality, what I have sovereignly done What did Abraham do to become the father of many nations? Well, what would be an easy assumption is that uh, there's a lot of works of the flesh in there. And, and so the Holy Spirit is going to go on and the Holy Spirit is going to go on and he's going to clearly point out, hey, Abraham didn't do anything. Now we know those of us who have, have read the Old Testament, we know that Abraham 
Abraham did try to do something. And Sarah, Sarah tried to do something. And normally we blame that on Sarah. Oh, maybe that's a guy thing. I don't know. But Abraham's name is the father of a multitude. He didn't have any kids. And Sarah was embarrassed about her husband because, you know, people probably taunted him, made fun of him. So she suggested this, and that may be true. I don't know. Maybe it, I, 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 I more tend to, to believe that Abraham probably engineered it through Sarah. The scriptures really aren't clear on that. It appears as though Sarah offered Hagar. It appears that way. It could be that Sarah offered Hagar because of Abraham's pressure. I don't know. But I tell you, with a man who had lots of servants and who was relatively wealthy, it's just something you couldn't have stopped if your life depended on it. The rumors that, that flew around that Abraham was going to to become involved with Hagar. Sure, uh, Abra Abraham tried something. And you know what the results were. We know what the outcome of that was. What our text is going to point out in the next few verses is that what Abraham did to become the father of many nations was absolutely nothing. Why is it that so much of modern Christianity does not want a sovereign God? I, I can't imagine. If my God is not sovereign and, and, and does what he pleases both in heaven and in earth, then I don't want to worship him. He's not much of a God. As it is written, I've already made you a father of many nations. And in God's presence, he believed, aorist tense, it's an aorist tense, and he believed that God who quickens the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which is written, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in, in the faithfulness, he considered his own body now dead, looked at it, contemplated it, he was about a hundred years old, and then he looked at the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. That's why he went into Hagar. Isn't it wonderful the way God looks at us? Most Christians suffer from an identity crisis. If, if Lot went to Sodom, I, I can't imagine myself saying that, that Sodom vexed Lot's righteous soul. you got to be kidding. The idiot decided to go his own way. Let him suffer. And God in no way, in no way, indicates that he holds anything against Lot. In fact, he couldn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah until Lot was out of there. Not a mention made of Hagar here. There will be in Galatians, but not here. What Abraham did in the flesh is not it's not part of our present study. What we are looking at is that new creation which is holy unblameable and unreprovable. 
Oh, dearly beloved, if, if you could just see in this passage of Scripture how God deals with a new creation in Christ. You have a treasure in an earthen vessel because God wants the excellency of the power to be in him. Abraham was in that same earthen vessel. He also had a nagging wife. And he also attempted in the power of the flesh to do that which he thought might help God. I assume he did. Maybe he just did it because it was a change and exciting. I don't know. It can be just as filthy as, as you want to look at it. It's not in our text. God sees Abraham as wholly unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And that is the way that he sees you. Who will lay anything, any charge against God's elect? It is God that justifies. What are you going to do? Are you going to are you going to go before God and say, God, wait just a minute here. In this text, it, you know, you've forgotten all about this mess with Hagar with Ishmael. What might have been arguments between Sarah and Abraham are not called to mind. You're a new creation in Christ. Former things are not called to mind. I admit in the earthen vessel that you know, what we live doesn't look very good. Some of you may remember that Joseph went down into Egypt because his brothers betrayed him and delivered him. And he became a power in Egypt. And he finally got his father and his brothers back down uh, into Egypt. And the, the point I want to make is he introduced Jacob to Pharaoh and Jacob said uh, that he had lived a hard and a troubled life. Difficult. That's crazy. Why doesn't he just say to Pharaoh, hey, you know, I, I'm an old man still in the strength of my youth. You know, been great. You know, I've got 12 kids and, and they're all back together. All back together now. Didn't. I don't think walking with the Lord is an easy exercise. But oh, the wonders of the grace of God that he sees me through Christ. That he not only predetermined and foreordained me, but he called me. He made me righteous. He glorified me, he set me apart, he glorified me, and I am his, and he is mine forever. Abraham's flesh is not involved. It was not the old Abraham that believed God in hope against hope. It was not the old Abraham that, that staggered not at the promise. Folks, it was the new creation made righteous in Christ that stood firm before God and so it is with you. That in you, which is new in Christ, is holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the wonders of your grace for the realization that that we belong to you that our lives 
are hid with Christ in God. May that truth just grip our hearts and may we rejoice in the truth of all of that. All that you have done for us. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.